The scripture reading this morning is Ezra 1, 1 through 5. Please stand for the reading of God's word out of reverence for the Lord and his word. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. This is God's word. It is true, and it is given out of his love. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Emily. And before all you guys leave, I just want to tell you how unbelievable the worship leadership is at this church. Thank you. Good morning. I tried to do that in the first service, but by the time I turned around, they were all gone. I'm Doug Shackford. I'm the elder here at the church. As mentioned last Sunday, different elders will be preaching this month. The purpose is for a few of us to express our heart for this body. Let us start with a prayer. Holy Spirit, come among us. Speak to each heart. Do your work. Amen. Today I thought that we would look at the last recorded Jewish history in the Old Testament as written in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah to explore what these ancient texts might say to us in 2023. Now Ezra has 10 chapters and Nehemiah has 13 and there is no time and ability for us to cover all the verses in all those chapters but hopefully we're going to hit some of the high points. Let me start with a little bit of background. After Solomon, David's son, the reigned, uh, the nation of Israel split. Now God had said that the people risk losing everything if they turn their backs on him, and God kept his promise. A couple of hundred years after Solomon, in 722 BC, the Assyrians swept into the northern kingdom, and they took all the people, and they scattered them all around the Assyrian Empire. They brought some people in from other parts of the Assyrian Empire, and they resettled them in the northern kingdom. And the people in that area became what we uh, know in the Bible as the Samaritans. About 125 years later, 586 B.C., after they had already deported some people, for example, Daniel, the Babylonians uh, turned Jerusalem into rubble, killed most of the people, took some of them away to uh, Babylon. Now, this is a, a very, very low point in Jewish history. Uh, one commentator I read described the Babylonian invasion as a holocaust to sort of give us a more modern uh, comparison. Despair, hopelessness, anger, identity crisis. Where was the God of the promised land, the everlasting Davidic um, kingdom, the future Messiah? His people are back in slavery, no no temple, no monarchy, no land. Effectively, we've gone back to Egypt. We've gone back to Pharaoh. About a thousand years has passed and nothing, in some sense, has occurred. But as we saw last week when Matt discussed the good word that Isaiah had for the people who were in exile, this week we see that as the world was crashing in, God gave a good word to Jeremiah. And this is what the, word, the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Talking about Jerusalem. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future in 70 years. But you know, 70 years is a long time. If we look back 70 years, 1953, Truman was president, Elizabeth was a brand new queen, and two of the things that, that really dominated uh, people's worries were polio and the Korean War. Or maybe we want to look in the future. 2093 will be 70 years from now. If my children are still alive, they will be in there. They will be beyond, beyond 100 years old. If my uh, grandchildren are still around, they'll be older than I am. If my great grandchildren, who I may never see, are alive, they'll be well into middle age. I will not be around in 2093, nor will most of us. And so, 2093 for me is a totally irrelevant year. And that's probably how most of the people felt about Jeremiah's prophecy. It's really irrelevant what's going to happen in 70 years. I've lost my family. I've lost my friends. I've lost my home. And besides, how would this go back to Jerusalem actually happen? Is it one day we're just going to walk out the door, wave goodbye to the Babylonian army and just stroll our way on back to Jerusalem? Or would we need Moses? We need all the plagues over. We've got, we got to go through that route again to get back so that takes us back to today's scripture that was read a few minutes ago. Seventy years have now indeed passed. And Babylon has just fallen to the Persians, which is something that would have been inconceivable 70 years ago. To fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy, God has stirred the hearts of the new conquering Persian king Cyrus. Now think about this. A pagan military dictator who just conquered Babylon and as part of his acquisition has all these Jewish slaves says to the Jewish slaves, I'm good. Y'all go on back home and build you a temple to your God. I do not think anybody would have predicted that. That's just not what you do when you conquer a region. I think it is fair to call that a miracle. And that leads to point number one for today. Everything starts with a miracle from God. Think about it. Creation, the exodus, the incarnation, the resurrection, that's just to name a few. These are all miracles that changed everything that came after them. So our story from Ezra and Nehemiah begins with a miracle. Now, and we're going to return to that story shortly, but first I want to talk about this church, the Chapel Hill Bible Church. This church started with a miracle. Now, I wasn't around for the first gathering in 1970 when God stirred the hearts of a handful of people to, to, to uh, form a new type of church in Chapel Hill. But I can tell you the founding elders were comprised of a professor, a doctoral student, a medical resident, and a medical student. Now, nothing against those men, but we got two students and we got a medical resident. For a startup organization, I'm not going to be investing a whole lot in their, that permanency of that group. Okay? And they don't sound very elderly to me. But I'm going to tell you that God's spirit was moving. Because when I did first show up at this church six years later as a first year student at UNC, Gerard Hall on campus was packed to the brim with undergraduates who were hearing preaching and music unlike anything they had ever heard before. And many lives were changed. And one of them was mine. And among other reasons I would call it a miracle is because I could look around at my fellow undergraduates and I knew none of them had any more money than I did, so I had no idea where they got any resources to do anything at that church. But by the time I was a senior, they had built a building that actually looked like a legitimate church structure. How did all that happen? Well, I argue that God willed it found the right leaders, and made it happen. I can tell you it was not because the people were perfect. The first Sunday that the Mason Farm Road location opened, I volunteered to help with the parking. It was a complete disaster. <laughs> no one paid any attention to any of us who were in charge of directing traffic. It reminded me of the last sentence in the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. <laughs> But the miracle that started this place has reached the ends of the earth. The diaspora from this church over the last 50 plus years 
has been extraordinary. Thousands and thousands have come to this church for work, for school, stayed here for a little while and moved on and carried a little bit of this church to every place in this country and across the globe, to places that we hear about regularly here, like Berlin and Jordan and Kenya. And now I must stop and give a shout out to my friend, Kiyomi. I was thrilled when I heard from Roddy that Kiyomi was here. I haven't seen Kiyomi, I don't believe, since I visited his home about a dozen years ago. But Kiyomi served along with me on our elder board, I guess now about 20 years ago. And Kiyomi is one of our brothers from Kenya. And it's a joy to have you here, Kiyomi. I'm very blessed. And, and the, the fact we have brothers and sisters in Kenya and all across this globe, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And we've planted churches in Chatham County that are flourishing. We have now started one in Hillsborough. I have no doubt it will flourish. It has been a great joy to me to be here decade after decade and, and watch God use this church for his glory. Now let's talk about some other miracles. Every believer begins with a miracle. In John 3, we read that, that Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. If you're a believer, somehow, some way, the Alpha and Omega, the omniscient, the all-powerful God, think about this, stirred your heart, a new spiritual birth occurred, and the Holy Spirit now lives inside of you. That is mind-blowing. The true you, the faith you, started with a miracle. And everything thereafter in your life was forever changed. I don't know that we spend enough time thinking about the miracle that is us as believers. The Almighty God has intervened. Now sadly, our lives don't soar from one miracle to another. Things never seem to go quite right in this world. People and things disappoint us. We get frustrated, we fail. Miracles fade in our memory. When bad stuff happens, the flood followed the creation. Forty years in the wilderness followed the exodus. The incarnation was crucified. Many who saw the resurrected Jesus ended up executed themselves. Likewise, after the miraculous proclamation by Cyrus resulted in 50,000 people traveling from Babylon to Jerusalem, that's like you or I walking to New England or South Florida, and arriving and worshiping in joy and excitement about rebuilding the temple, after seeing the prophecy come true in their lifetime, the returning exiles only worked on the temple for a few months, and then they quit. They quit because they encountered resistance from the Samaritans. Remember, they were the people who had been moved in. And the, the Samaritans uh, res gave resistance because... They don't want to give up any of their power and control. They're the people who control that region. So the exiles got scared and they quit working on the temple. And that's in Ezra 4. Have you ever been on a spiritual high only to find your enthusiasm for Jesus wore off when things didn't go as you hoped and planned and you feel like, you're, feel like quitting on the job because God, you think, has given up on you or maybe you just decide to give up on the faith altogether? Well, that's what happened to our exiles a few months after returning to Jerusalem, a few months after they witnessed this incredible miracle of freedom. The prophet Haggai had some harsh words for these returnees. Here's what, how the book of Haggai starts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So apparently they quit working on the temple, which the Samaritans opposed, but they, they appear to have had no trouble running out to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, getting some materials and building their own house. What are we laboring for today? 
Are we doing the task God has given us for? Or are we building our own homes and reputations apart from the Lord? Anyhow, it took about 15 years for Haggai and some others to prod these people into resuming the rebuilding. This time, once again, the Samaritans protest, but this time they stood up to him. And, and this time a new pagan king, now come to power, named Darius gets involved, and Darius supports the rebuilding, and he orders the Samaritans to help fund the construction so the temple finally gets completed and the people celebrate in Ezra chapter 6. That leads to our second point for today. Although everything starts with a miracle from God, and the miracles are wonderful, pretty soon we have to learn to live by faith. Now when we go to the next chapter, chapter 7, 60 years has passed. There's a break in the action, we've got a 60 years go by, and now we meet the man who is, the book is named after. We meet Ezra himself. And Ezra is introduced as a man who, quote, had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and rules in Israel. Let me reread that because that's really powerful. Had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. That's Ezra 7.10. He studies, he does, and he teaches. That's really a, that's a wonderful thing to be said of in the Bible. So Ezra is a highly distinguished priest, scholar, and teacher of the law of Moses. He lives in Babylon, and he happens to be a, a friend of the new pagan king, Artaxerxes. Repeatedly, we are told the hand of God is on Ezra. Because the hand of God is on him, he, quote, took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with him to Jerusalem. That's verse 28, in chapter 7. And the king grants him everything he requests in verse 6, which includes lots of gold and silver. But Ezra has a problem. He's leading 5,000 people across 800 miles over the next four months, loaded down with lots of gold and silver and other valuables, through an, a territory that is noted for having bandits and thieves. How does Ezra put it? In chapter 8 he says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children and our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way. Since we had told the king, we kind of posted out our, our chest, and we said the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him and the power of our, his wrath is against all who forsake him. It's kind of, there's a good strong statement to make and it's easy to make that statement until you actually run into bandits and robbers. So we fasted and employed our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. So even Ezra, a big-time preacher, a man on whom the hand of God is on, found that he too had to learn to live by faith, depend desperately on God for protection and not the king's army when he left the palace for a dangerous place. How about us? Do we live by faith? Or by the protection of our degrees, prestige, bank accounts, careers. As some of you know, until a few months ago, I was the dean of UNC's Kenyon Flagler Business School. I was typically introduced both personally and professionally, and oftentimes in this church, as the dean. 4,000 students, faculty and staff, and about 40,000 alums looked to me as the leader of our school. Then I retired, and as a friend mentioned, and one day I went from who's who to who's he. <laughs> I'd always tried to make sure my identity was not in my work, but when you're known by your publications and your lectures, your public figure on campus, and you live in a college town, that's difficult. I'm still trying to figure out who I am and what I'm supposed to do. It's not easy. What is your identity? What is the Chapel Hill Bible Church's identity? I can remember when we were the only evangelical church in town, the one where all the college students came. We were the cool church. What are we today? Let me state my view. We should never strive to be defined by our size or our coolness. The Chapel Hill Bible Church has only one identity. We are God's. 
We are His and His alone. Wherever He leads, whatever He wants, that is our calling. And we live by faith, not by sight, individually and corporately as a body. Now, the Chapel Hill Bible Church has, has both known God's hand and it's also learned to live by faith. We saw an example earlier with Martin, learning to live by faith. Let me give you an example that relates to the, the very building we're in right now. As we were pre preparing to sign the loan documents to purchase the land we're on, that very same week, the founding pastor of this church, the teaching pastor who was in the pulpit almost every week, and had been for almost 30 years, he resigned. The very same week we were about to sign the papers. That was a traumatic moment for this body. We needed more space, that was quite obvious, but only if the people who were coming continued to come, and it wasn't clear they'd continue to come if that pastor left. What if many of them decided to go when he left? And I can tell you many did go. Would we even continue as a church body? It was not an easy decision. But by faith, the leadership decided to move forward, purchase this land, and eventually build these buildings. In retrospect, we can see that God's hand was on that decision. First, two days after we opened this building, 9-11 occurred. If you remember that date, Everyone was shocked, traumatized, frightened. And a lot of people began to rethink church, rethink relationship with God. And we had a facility, a big facility, for them to reconsider Jesus. Second, over the last two decades, far, far more people have been able to be blessed through this church because we've been in this facility and then if we'd stayed on the much smaller facility at Mason Farm Road. Now back to Ezra. So Ezra finally gets to Jerusalem safely, and he's horrified by what he finds. The Israelites, including many of the leaders, have intermarried with the heathen in the region. We're now in chapter 9. Now I can see how this might have happened. The early exiles were probably overwhelmingly male and young. They were frontiersmen, pioneers, adventure seekers. An 800-mile journey through wilderness to a place that has no housing, no food, no shelter is probably not a place that would attract families with small children or old folks or people who just enjoyed the, the comforts of an extraordinary city like Babylon. But eventually these young adventurers want to meet some young Jewish women and there's not enough to go around. So they look outside the community and the next thing you know, Jewish men have heathen wives. But Ezra is horrified by this because the key reason they were sent into exile was that the, the culture of the people of Israel had become indistinguishable from the culture of the surrounding peoples. And in fact, one of the reasons they had become indistinguishable was because they had been intermarried. And when you intermarried, they'd take on the worship of the people they had married. And so one of the reasons they had gone into exile and into slavery was, was exactly what they had gotten themselves right back into as soon as they got out of slavery and got out of exile. So Ezra says, you've got to divorce your heathen wives. Now that's pretty heavy. You've got to think about that. But the book of Ezra closes with the people agreeing with Ezra and divorcing their wives. That leads to our third point. Although everything starts with a miracle from God. And even after we've learned to live by faith, we're called to be different, to be holy. And sometimes that's painful. Sometimes that's not easy. Now, I'm not calling for mass divorces. Rather, what does it mean for us today to be different and holy? Would a social scientist studying in the Chapel Hill Bible Church find us any different from the rest of our local culture? At the Last Supper, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do we differ on the love dimension? Are we different in the way we interact with our brothers and sisters here? With our families? With our friends? Our neighbors? At work? On social media. Now let's up the ante. 
Do we love our enemies? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard it said, You should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that your sons of, so you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, I've got to admit, when I read stuff like this, I wonder if it's just hyperbole. Can Jesus actually be serious about loving your enemies? I got problems loving my friends. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you. Does he really mean love your enemies? Recently, I was talking with a person who had just had lunch with some people who have been planning churches in Ukraine. I found her report remarkable. She said they're only preaching one topic in those churches. Love your enemy. Everyone seems to know someone who has died or lost their home because of the war. So what are those churches preaching? Love the Russians. One way they're getting the message across is this. Any minute you may find yourself in the arms of Jesus. That's just how real and imminent death is during a congregants. And they're telling them, and you don't want your last thought to be one of hatred. You want to stroll into heaven with love on your heart. Now that's different. If our brothers and sisters in Ukraine can forgive and love Russian soldiers, surely we can love and forgive the folks we encounter here. 1 Peter 4.8 reads, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Loving one another earnestly will make us different and holy. Now, back to Jerusalem. Over a decade has passed. It's now about a hundred years since the uh, first exiles left Babylon and went to Jerusalem. And we're introduced to a new fellow. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Jew. He's in Babylon. He serves as the king's cup, cup bearer. Now the cupbearer's job was to test the king's drinks. If they're poisoned, then the cupbearer dies instead of the king. And I was reading a, a commentator who said that the cupbearer may have been the most trusted official in the palace because of this, the importance of his position, and second only to the queen as a consultant. Now think about the position that Nehemiah has risen to. Nehemiah was a Jewish slave in Persia who has risen to the very top of the political, administrative, and social ladder in the entire Persian Empire. Now Nehemiah has had opportunities, obviously, to go back to Jerusalem. He could have gone with Ezra a little bit earlier. But I mean, Nehemiah is a big shot. The book of Nehemiah opens with his inquiring about Jerusalem, which was probably like a like a gnat in the entire Persian Empire. And here's how the book of Nehemiah opens. Here's the report he receives. The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. When Nehemiah receives this report, he's shocked and he's grieved. So you tell me a hundred years have gone by and they haven't gone around to basic reconstruction and security of the city that houses the temple. This is just not any city. This is the city of God. This is God's temple. So Nehemiah begins to pray and fast, asking God, God, you got to do something. God says, Nehemiah, you're right. I got to do something. So Nehemiah, and so God stirs the heart of Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem and rebuild it in chapter 2. Now, Nehemiah was born in exile. He's never been to Jerusalem. His interest is inherited. And some of you might be able to uh, identify with this. You have parents or grandparents or maybe great-grandparents. They grew up outside the U.S., but you've never been back to your ancestral homeland. You've just heard some stories about it. There's not a natural reason for Nehemiah to leave being one of the top officials in the entire Persian Empire to go back to lowly Jerusalem. Somebody else can go build the wall and the gates. But as with the beginning of the book of Ezra, God has stirred a heart. 
And Nehemiah asks for a leave of absence, and the king grants it. The king even puts, decide, appoints him as the governor of the whole region. And Nehemiah heads to Jerusalem with the king's support to rebuild the wall and gates around the city. Now back then, no wall, no gates, no city. Without wall and gates, there's no protection from enemies or wild animals or weather. Jerusalem may have had a temple, but it's completely exposed, and few people were choosing to live in Jerusalem. But we'll find that building a wall and gates is not very easy. This time their enemies have expanded beyond the Samaritans to include other regional powers and even some of the leading Jews in the region because if Jerusalem becomes a powerful city, that again is going to affect my power as a, another person outside of Jerusalem. So I'm not really so sure I want to go along with this rebuild Jerusalem. And so they do everything they can to frustrate and stop the construction. They start by questioning the viability of the project, asking how can a wall be built out of the rubble left behind by the Babylonians? In Nehemiah 4.3, there's actually a kind of funny part where one of the, the uh, enemies says, you could put a little bitty fox on top of a wall built with those stones and the little bitty fox would break the whole wall down. So don't tell me you can even do this. It's not even possible. And then in another... Um, place they say <coughs> Nehemiah didn't come here to build a wall or gates Nehemiah wants to be the king so they questioned his integrity and his incentives that didn't work so in chapter 6 they decide to assassinate him but unlike when the construction of the temple was stopped with opposition the enemies of God fail with the in this case in fact the wall was built in 52 days 52 days. I don't know how long it would take to get a permit. <laughs> um, but 52 days is a short period. In fact, I looked at the calendar. 52 days ago was the Friday before Thanksgiving. How was this possible? Well, in Nehemiah 6.16 6, we read, it was possible because of the help of our God. It reminds me of uh, when Jesus is asked about salvation in Matthew 19, 26, and he says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, Nehemiah constructed a real wall with real gates in a real city, but he also foreshadowed another construction project, the building of the church. Let's look at Peter, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. Because it also talks about building with stones. It says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Now that is a reference to Jesus. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot in that verse. Okay. There's a sermon of, in that verse. Maybe there's a series of sermons in, that, in those two verses alone. And so I'm not even going to start to be able to get into the fullness of, of that little short passage. But I want to focus on the living stones becoming a spiritual house and a royal priesthood. Now, I'm no geologist, but I know that stones are not alive. Okay. But Peter here is referring to believers as living stones. And the spiritual house is the church. Now we can begin to draw some parallels between Nehemiah's wall and Christ's church. Nehemiah built his wall with rubble. The Bible says there were broken, burned stones. Remember the fox could break down that wall. In chapter, and, and Christ is building his church with human rubble. Broken, burned out people. In chapter 3, we, we learn a bit about the actual individuals who built Nehemiah's wall. A few had construction skills, but most of them had no qualifications for wall or gate building. In fact, one of his repairs was in the perfume business. That's Nehemiah 3.8. Similarly, sometimes the Lord uses our talents and gifts for His glory, but more often we're simply called to obey. And in God's construction of the church, He finds a role for each of us as members of the body of Christ, and each part is important. 
You can see 1 Corinthians 12 for an elaboration and expansion on that. Here's the bottom line. Nehemiah took rubbish and people who had failed to secure the city for a hundred years and built a wall and gates in 52 days. Christ takes struggling people who need to be forgiven, who need a Savior, who are looking for love and life and truth in all the wrong places and brings them together as members of His body. That leads us to point four. We're under construction. We have not arrived. We, the church, is still being built. We have a long ways to go before we are a completed spiritual house and a royal priesthood. But we have an extraordinary project manager in Jesus Christ. Now, Nehemiah types who serve in so-called secular jobs, such as wall or gate building or the perfume business, are near and dear to me. I struggled for a long time because I mistakenly felt God had no vital role for me since I never felt I had a call to full-time ministry. I wasn't, apparently wasn't needed on the varsity or, or the JV or the cheerleading team or the band or anywhere. I thought my job was to sit up in the stands and cheer for the, you know, the, the other, the real people and maybe put a little money in the plate. Um, I wasn't one of the stars. You know, the stars are the people like start churches in the Ukraine. It took me a long time to realize that I was called to build cities, or in my particular case, to be an educator. Over time, I've learned that all believers are called to be on the front line, on the field, on the varsity, that there's no second team, that there is no secular, sacred divide in our vocations. If my struggles resonate with you and you're interested in becoming more Nehemiah-like, you can consider Triangle Fellows. It's designed to equip people in secular positions for gospel leadership. You can check out their website or you can ask its founder, Kyle, or Roddy, who serves on the board, or me about it. Now back to ancient Jerusalem. Suppose you were part of a group that built a wall and a gate around all of Jerusalem in 52 days. Wouldn't you just be in such awe of, of our great God that you just wouldn't ever do anything wrong again? Well, apparently not. Apparently, those people are a lot like us. We see miracles, and then we go right back to our old ways the next day. Because in chapter 5, it begins with, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. And one commentary that I read stated that the word translated outcry in this verse is the same word in the original ancient text is the word used to describe the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and the cry against Exodus, uh, the cry against Egypt in Exodus 3. So this sin in, in Nehemiah 5 suggests something as revolting as the sins that led to the annihilation of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the uh, plagues in Egypt and the destruction of its military. That sin is greed. Something that doesn't always make the top of the list of our most grievous transgressions, but perhaps it should. In this case, the haves are taking advantage of the have-nots. During a famine, the folks that have food are charging exorbitant interest rates for those that don't have food, and they're effectively putting their brothers and sisters back into slavery through debt. Nehemiah is irate. Only a few decades earlier, all of them had been in slavery, and now some of them are going back into slavery because they don't have any food, and their brothers and sisters won't share the food with them. Nehemiah was a serious guy about holiness, and the rest of the book of Nehemiah is filled with his demands that the people who live in the city of God, where the temple of God is at, where God resides, those people are called to be holy. He, the, he demands it from the people over and over. And this leads to confession, repentance, and a commitment to follow the Lord, including restoring feast, Sabbath rest, and temple rules as detailed in the law of Moses. But it's interesting, this revival is triggered by a dawn to noon reading by Ezra from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. When the people hear Ezra read, they begin to weep as they realize how far they have fallen from God's standard for them. This repentance caused by Ezra's reading of the first five books of the Bible reminds me of Hebrews 4.12.
<coughs> excuse me, which reads, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that leads to our last point for today. The Bible has power. To summarize our takeaways from Ezra and Nehemiah, thank God for his miracles in your life and in this body throughout the church universe. Live by faith. Be different. Holy. Recognize we're still a work in progress. And the Bible has power for all of this. From its beginning, as suggested by our name, the Chapel Hill Bible Church has always looked to the Bible for our source of teaching and guidance. It's been a great comfort to me to know that God's Word will be preached every Sunday from this pulpit and the daily decisions and actions of this body will be based on our best understanding of the Scripture. The Bible is a complex collection of many books written over a lengthy period. Much of our faith is a mystery. I don't pretend to know or understand it all, nor do I expect our staff or lay leaders to know or understand it all. I'm sure when we're on the other side, face to face with the Lord, we'll learn we were wrong about some things. But I do believe this church has always tried to let the Holy Spirit speak to us through His living Word rather than we attempt to use the Scriptures to support our ideas and thinking. And I pray that will always be true at this church. Now, with the close of the book of Nehemiah, and there's, as you might imagine, far more than I've had time to cover, the Scriptures go silent for 400 years. If you think 70 years is a long time, 400 years is a long time. Once the fullness of time had come, as Galatians 4 puts it, the Bible heralds the arrival of a better Ezra and a better Nehemiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Like Ezra and Nehemiah, Jesus willingly left a comfortable, distinguished, regal place where he was treated appropriately for miserable, fearful, abandoned people. He too faced internal and external oppositions. Dependent on God and prayer, got his hands dirty and kept his focus to the end. And like them, he came to enable us to enjoy a far better place, a new Jerusalem. A home with God forever. Not because we deserve heaven. No one does. But because Jesus' death and resurrection opens the door for all who trust Him. That new Jerusalem is our true homeland. Where all of us are designed to dwell. A perfect place with our Creator. We are exiles in this world waiting until He calls us home. So let me close where I started. A miracle. I'm sure some here today have never experienced the believer's miracle that I mentioned. And you aren't confident you will live a God in heaven forever. You may not understand everything I have said or even much of it. But deep inside you sense there's something to this. Millions over the centuries have sensed what you sense. And have responded positively and point to that moment as the most important in their life, their personal mi miracle. Years ago, I was a skeptic. But one night, I felt there was something so real that I couldn't shake it. Here's what I silently said in my heart. God, if you exist, I'm here to listen. Immediately thereafter, I didn't sense anything. So I figured, okay. Just as I thought, there's no God. The next morning I woke up and everything inside of me seemed like it had changed and was different. Now I'm not saying you'll have that experience. Everybody's miracle is different and personal. But I do urge you to do what I did. Offer as much faith as you have. You can tell I only had a tiny bit. To as much of God as you grasp, which you, you can tell for me wasn't much. Take this moment, reach out to him, and give him a chance to respond to you. And then tell somebody what you, 
You just did before you leave today. You can speak to our elders. They'll be over here to the right. Your right. They're here to pray with anyone. Or you can tell a friend who you came with today. Or you can, you can find me. I'll just be hanging out up here. This is your day for your personal miracle. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you alone are worthy. Bless those hearts you are stirring this morning. May they hear your voice and respond. Amen.